then we have like an XO Dragon Ball. So we took the XO from the tram, and then within five minutes, we put all the XO on the, on the not, not the tram reel, up the tram. And then we went to the uh, Victoria Park, the Hang Fa, Fa and then we took the, the Central Library, the, the, the staircase, then we create the Expo base out of that, uh, Dragon out of the Expo. So two of them uh, were together with the parents, they came along to be part of that fun thing that we had. Right? So, but anyway, observe what they do if they can, but you know, uh, this is uh, about one nut of the chart, okay? So anyway, we will get started. So what we have, as I say, is uh, I'd like to welcome you all, you know, have a way from your busy schedule just to come here. As I say, you know, I don't really know, when I started this, I don't really know whether I could get the audience or not. And the pressure is on me because we have two ladies from Harvard, uh, from America, coming here to be called, and I, I suggested that, well, we should have an afternoon seminar uh, to recruit volunteers to be part of what we are doing. So anyway, I mean, I'm very uh, thankful that this is happening. And again, like any voluntary work, you know, if you do something, and if somebody has some reaction back to you, you get energized, right? So I have to thank Charles and Liv, because uh, over life, we say that we would like to do it in uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic. And they say that, well, fine, we'll do the advertising for you and we'll even book a room for you. So we have to thank them, because, without, uh, because I'm not a staff here, I can't book a room, but as a student, we can, okay? So we have give a, 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 a So anyway, uh, two hours, and hopefully these two hours will be interactive with question and answer, right? So as you see, we have seen the poster, and again, I have to make some acknowledgement Without this poster, I don't think I can go very far with publicity. In the world of marketing, in the world of marketing... Well, don't, market get... huh? don't market to me. Don't market to me. No, 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 I'm marketing this. Don't look at that one. Don't look at that one. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, the world has changed, you know. It used to be very text-based. You just put some... When I remember when I had the first seminar many years ago, 20 years ago. You just type right to text-based, then you fax to people, and people will start coming. But in today's world, it's so difficult to be an audience. I can tell you, it's very, very difficult. Okay, so I got hold of Kelvin on Facebook. I said, I need some help for a poster. And I think within two hours, he got the first draft to be done. And then we have to work on the draft for another one week before we get something like that. So all because of Kelvin. Kelvin is a good representation of what we call volunteer because he's just 17, he's still in secondary school, but he's putting his skills into good use. And again, this is the topic that we'll be talking about. All of you will have some skills you can put it into good use in what we call casual volunteerism. Okay? So what I'm gonna do now is to say bye to later. All right, okay. Okay, uh, you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, I make it very short <laughs> to cover the essentials. You know what I mean? In order to make a interesting appealing uh, short speech you to make it appealing and at the same time short like a mini squad <laughs> okay now uh, he is the best of all the best impromptu speaker and organizer so I came here as an impromptu moderator that's what he wrote on the email to me <laughs> so, well we worked together beautifully for many years uh, I'm a member of the Hong Kong Association for educational communications and technology. I was the uh, past president for 20 years, and I am a fellow of the uh, association. So this is Leo Yang, and been teaching for many years, and I belong to the uh, digital minigram. Migrated, my Mi migrated, uh, what do you call it, citizen. So I belong to the uh, to the 30th uh, stage of a generation. You just guess how old I am. <laughs> or, or you belong to the 19th, 90th uh, generation. So I just make it easier for all of us. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Ed Denka to all of us. Another beautiful lady. Yeah. So, so
and uh, Miss Mackenzie, and beautiful lady too, from yeah. Hover, right? And of course, we have Kathleen, uh, and our lady from uh, So the stage is yours, and uh, plus the fact that we have two young, young, young persons to, uh, to work with us. It's very interactive. So the floor is yours, okay? Give the big hand to four of them. So what I'm going to do is to set the stage because uh, some of you are new to RPC, but some of you are not new to LPC because we have some edu, edu volunteers here who are the first people who went to Sichuan to deploy. They are already here, right? So we have, I think, a, a very interesting mix of people. So, but anyway, uh, just to give you an introduction, uh, this is one of the one laptop per child, right? So we call it OLPC. And this is the uh, parent organization based in the US. It started with MIT, Major <coughs> Megaponte, who had that vision to say that there are millions of children in the world who have no access to education, right? You can build schools, fine, but after building schools, you need to have a lot of resources. You need to have teachers. And teachers take time to train. But the children are growing up. Imagine if you are three or four years old, within two or three years, your brain has developed up to a certain level. So they need something very quickly, right? And we felt that the best way that we could help children is to give them a laptop. And that's why the one laptop per child is, is what we started. In Hong Kong, we have the one laptop per child Asia, right? And so we have the Panda Bear, and because this is the first department we did in Sichuan, right? So what I want to do now is just to give you some video so that you can look at it to see what it is. And very short video, but it will be very, very sound like a to the point. One laptop per child. That's our name and our vision. We want to create educational opportunities for the world's poorest children by providing each and every one with a rugged, low-cost, low-power, connected laptop. And this is that laptop. Say hello to the XO, a computer unlike any other designed specifically to work in tough conditions and remote areas. It comes packed with software and activities to help kids learn, explore, create, and share no matter what language they speak or where they live, the XO connects them to each other, to the world, and to a brighter future. We're a nonprofit organization, which makes these kids our mission, not our market. That's why wherever the XO goes, there are five core principles everyone agrees to. First, kids get to keep the laptops. They have to be free to take them home and use them whenever they want. That's kind of the point. Second, we're focused on early education, which means kids about six to 12 years old. Third, we have to deal in large numbers of laptops, so whole classrooms and schools get them at the same time, so no one gets left out. Fourth, kids should have a connection to the internet, because there's neat stuff to learn on the internet. Fifth and finally, the XO must include free and open source software. Then the laptop itself can easily grow and adapt with the needs of the child. So, in a nutshell, that's us, an organization that makes a small computer to serve a big cause bringing education to children all over the world with one laptop per child. So what we're going to do now, we're going to give you a cap and you start donating money to the laptop, right? <laughs> now, <laughs> think about it, man. Just listening to this, do you agree that every kid should have a laptop? Some, uh, this is very, a uh, lot of people have different arguments. Some say that, well, if they have no water, uh, if they have no food, uh, why should you spend time giving them a laptop? So. What they have is the part two, which actually tells you a little bit more. The real question is, why? why? Why give a laptop to a child who may have no electricity or even running water? That's a very good question. But if you substitute the word laptop with education, the answer becomes clear. You don't stop education until all other challenges are solved. You do them at the same time because education is the foundation of the other solutions. That's why we designed the XO to work in the places that need it the most. Rugged, because these are kids after all, and kids tend to be, well, kids. Low cost, so we can make a lot of them, for very little. 
low power. So even in places with no electricity, it can be charged with alternate sources like solar power. Connected, so kids can access the internet, share files with each other, and collaborate on projects. The XO also has a screen you can read in direct sunlight, because many of the children we reach go to school outdoors. The XO comes with a built-in webcam for pictures and video clips and a ton of education-focused software. All these features and many, many more add up to one incredible result. When the XO comes to a classroom or village, kids get engaged, inspired. They go to school more often and stay there longer. They draw pictures, play music, make movies, write stories. They figure out how to do new things and begin to teach each other and even their parents. With the XO, kids learn to solve their own challenges. And one day, they might even help us solve ours. That's how we'll change the world. And that's the best answer to why give a laptop. So, give a laptop, change the world. Now, put your money out. <laughs> okay, so this is the advertisement uh, I think made a few years ago, where they have to give one, give one. They actually encourage people to give one in order to give one for themselves. So, like, I have two there, and I can actually I have four in order to have four. Okay, so, and it's, the laptop is not something that you can just buy off the shelf. It's very, very good. Uh, uh, children are given it at cost. Now, what I'm going to show now is a, a video clip, very short video clip from Peru, because our next speaker will be from Peru. And uh, just to give you a feel of the kind of situation that you know, I, I don't, I don't believe that all Peru is like that, but it's still very common in a lot of the world. Okay? So just have a look at this. <coughs> it's from a video clip, Life in a Day. They follow with people from all over the world. So they made a light in the day of Abel and his laptop. That's an English here. My dad. Giant library. Okay. So I hope you are convinced. And now, what we're going to do now is to say we're going to pass it to Sri Lanka, who will uh, go to the next part. Okay. The name of today's seminar is Digital Literacy. So the next speaker is Ed Stenker to give you a review on information communication technology in rural schools in Peru. Let's welcome her, please. The time for presentation is roughly about 20 minutes. All right? Roughly. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.
Shin, uh, it was intended not, not to entertainment, but for learning. That was the key that my uh, authorities in my country uh, put attention in this machine. The hardware was good, and also the software, because it was free software. So that's why it was cheap. And my government thought that it was a good uh, device for rural children. And they had many activities just uh, for learning. The children uh, can learn doing and also collabora um, in collaboration. Um, let me explain. My country uh, has um, is in South America now. In South America, close to Brazil. So we have different kinds of people living there in the Andean region, maybe you know Machu Picchu, you know the high mountains, the same attitude like like Tibet, Lhasa, the same attitude. And also we have the Amazon, the Amazon, the Amazon River, and we have people, Amazon in the village. So my government thought about how to close how to close the digital gap. You know, it's advanced the knowledge uh, uh, and this century advanced very fast, but these people, my people, was little hard to say uh, left behind. So the government said, how to close easy and uh, faster this digital gap, and also how to give them access to knowledge. So that's what uh, they thought in these this machine was really a good alternative for them. Um, it was thought about preparing about in elementary schools, not kindergarten, but in elementary schools, and something difficult maybe to understand for you. In rural areas, we don't have infrastructure. We don't have access or connection to internet, mm -hmm. not at all. It's very difficult for my country. Only in urban cities, we, we have access to mobile and for internet. So in rural areas, how we can give or my government thought to buy this machine? Because they can communicate uh, through the, uh, the red in, inside the village, but also my government put a lot of information, for example, the Wikipedia is inside the machine. So the, the children, they don't need to access or to look for internet because they live very, very far away. But they can be learning. Also, was thought about kind of ebook. So many uh, information, uh, readings was provided for these children inside the laptop. Also, every laptop was given for one children and <coughs> one for the teacher. So after that, my government also started to in, um, make a training uh, that was very difficult because they realized that teachers, most of them in rural areas, also they didn't have never before a computer, even the teachers. So to start training was also started to, <gasps> what, how is a computer, how it works, was, actually was very difficult. It was very yeah. difficult to, to introduce also teachers to computers for the first time. For the children it was the first time, but also for teachers was for the first time. So it was a really, really great challenge for, for my country. But anyway, uh, they started a pilot and started a training, providing materials and, and examples and using the simulations. Actually, the machine is very powerful. They have uh, many activities that allow the creativity and the science. We can use it with sensors. And also, my government gave some ideas for using from the pedagogical side, you know, uh, building uh, conceptual maps, and also the creativity, exploring what these children know. 
uh, about the reality, the rivers, their environment. So they can do it many animations and creating music and so many activities. Well, actually, uh, the digital gap <laughs> uh, and the access uh, put a lot of challenge and we were thinking about how to improve education and also feel more challenges because another thing was the language. These children, my country speaks Spanish, but these minority children, they speak native language and they are very different. And also the approach, then we realized that they, they learn a different way that the elders in these communities, they say that actually the traditional way to learn is more Western education, Western style like these divisions of math, science, Spanish, uh, the, the, the common curriculum, elders, they say, no. It would be better to think about us. This technology can give us, uh, us a voice as a community. So that's what I also, to choose to come here and hope for you, to provide a space to these native people and different kind of education, respecting their beliefs, their traditions, their language. Anyway, I want to use it, this, this machine because it allows us to give them voices. So they put uh, their traditions, their history in the way <laughs> I was uh, also the learning English was this even for teachers was a little difficult. Anyway, um, we try to create partnership in my country with local uh, authorities and also the um, university, like here, the volunteers. My government has put the money for the implementation, but how to make it work, we need people and we need people with passion. And we found it in the volunteer people, you know, who wants to help our people to make it better, to help, to improve. So my government just gave the, um, I say, the training in how to use the hard, the hard work. And, and the, the local authorities um, knowing my expertise in this area asked me to to write a more oriented to the teachers, to teachers from rural areas. So I wrote my book, thinking in my colleagues to prepare materials according to our understanding, our context, because it's very different from the city, completely different. And well, I, I never thought that <laughs> this, this book would uh, be uh, had an impact and it was translated in another language. So we understand that there was a need for these, um, I call it, to integrating, uh, to put in the laptop into the classroom, how to make this integration. It's very difficult. So we, I, I know that we have to put more effort, also the, the teachers and the parents, <laughs> yeah to make it this real, real, real integration. And it's a free open source book, right? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, we put it... It's in Chinese, without your permission. Yeah, 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 we put it for, for free. Okay. We put it for free. And another thing was uh, these children, oh. these poor children, they, they don't have books at home. They don't have TV at home, no, no TV in this rural area. So when they receive the, the device and they say, this is yours, was it, you know, the motivation, the self-esteem was, oh, this is kind of too bad, the very special toys. And something interesting happens. Children love it very much about the media. Taking pictures and making videos was amazing to, 
to discover themselves. And that's what I say. Uh, this kind of the media, uh, the digital literacy should be approached not just on the, the text stories, because they speak another language. It's difficult for them to read and try to understand this much. Oh, but in their own language, it was amazing. So I, I understand that cognitive size of these children is also changing. Sadly, in the evaluations for international organizations, they say, oh, what kind of learning is happening? Maybe more than learning, is happening in really a cognitive change. That's what I, I, I think, because they, they have a new device that can enhance your thinking and can enhance your learning. So this is my, my presentation for giving you a, an idea that what happens in Peru and actually the children, they, they are very happy, happy uh, having this, this device. They never had it, even the mobile, they don't know, but ah, they, they love it as, as you saw. They put it kind of, the, ma the machine is not an object for them, it's a kind of brain. It has some, let's say, making human, it's like a brain, they, they make it. Something like that. So this is what I wanted to share with you. This words means xie This words means doce. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope okay. this gives you an approach. Very good. So next one. Next one. Uh, we have uh, two uh, beautiful, again, ladies from Oxford, uh, Harvard, yeah. Both are very good schools. To present us with their research, oh yeah, research on Tin Sai Wai and then uh, Tin Moon, how children learn and make a difference. All right? Okay, shall we give them big hands, please? Very good. And you introduce yourself, make it more interactive, all right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so Mackenzie and I are here to talk about the Digital Literacy Project, known as DigiLit, lovingly. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Do I need this, or can you all hear me? It's good for recording. recording. Oh. Oh, okay. You turn it on, it's off. <laughs> We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization based at Harvard College. Mackenzie and I were originally interested in the One Laptop Per Child project. We went to OLPC to look into volunteering, and they said, you know what we really need help with? It's the education side. And so we ended up starting DigiLit to focus on keeping the EXO from being this glamorous afterthought in the classroom. And so just to introduce ourselves, I'm Caitlin. Um, I graduated from Harvard with a degree in molecular and cellular biology and fine arts. I went to Bain and Company. It's a management consulting firm. We have an office actually here in Hong Kong, so some of you may be familiar with it. Um, so I have a business and science background, um, and I think it's my love of technology and trying to make technology more approachable for different people that drew me to one laptop or child. Um, this fall, I'm actually going to the University of Southern California for film school, so we'll further be getting involved in the media landscape. And I'm Mackenzie. I went to Harvard and I immediately after that went to get my master's at Oxford University in the UK. And since last uh, year I've been working for CNN and I started with Fareed Zakaria. He has a weekly foreign affairs show and I now work for Anderson Cooper in live news. And so for me, uh, much of my interest in the EXO and in, uh, and in integrating technology into the classroom has to do with the ways that multimedia and internalizing information uh, can be distilled through uh, video uh, and clearly in the news business we're all about uh, making making ideas uh, read on read through film so. just to give you a little bit more context about digilit we have three core key pieces to our mission statement so for one we do initiate and support one laptop or child programs around the world those may not have to do with the XO, so we're hardware <coughs> neutral. As of now, we work with the XO laptop. We have worked with ThinkPads in the past, so that may be an interesting discussion that we'll want to talk about afterwards. Um, so we actually raise money for those laptops, and then we send volunteers to the classroom to support them because we believe that on-site 
volunteership is, is really important for sustaining those programs. Um, we also develop laptop-based training programs and curriculum. We'll actually share a lesson plan with you later. We'll actually run through a training session, so you'll get some idea of what it's like to be students in our pilot classrooms. And then we conduct formal research studies. We actually have published articles, and Mackenzie will talk a little bit more about this when she talks about our Boston deployments, but um, essentially we've looked at things like collaborative behavior, you know, how, how does the EXO really have an impact on the classroom? There's not a lot of research in this, in this area, even though there are three million EXOs worldwide. So that's, that's something we want to push. We really hope that maybe we can get more of your support with that here in Hong Kong. So we want to give you a sense of the type of work that we've been doing for the past four years. Uh, we initially started with uh, domestic-based pilots in the Boston area. And so the Cambridge Friends School is an independent school, and the Mission Hill School is a Boston public school. And in the United States, that distinction is very important. Um, when you are an independent school, there's much more flexibility in terms of curriculum development and being able to um, go away from state standards. And so for us, that was a really important starting point because so much of the work that we're doing is curriculum oriented in developing learning materials around the XO so it can be properly integrated into learning. And so over to this table here, you're going to see a bundle of lessons. And that's an example of the types of materials we were developing in the Boston area. It was really our testing ground. So we started at uh, the Cambridge Friends School, as I said, and we worked with both sixth graders to start, which is right at the cusp at the, at the higher end of um, student age uh, where you'd want to use the XO. And then we uh, transitioned it back to third grade to a third grade classroom. And with the Mission Hill School, um, we deployed the XO in two different settings. So the first was an after-school setup where we were able to use it in a more informal capacity to supplement uh, classroom learning. And the second was when we actually were integrating it into uh, classes during the school day. And uh, let Caitlin explain our international deployment. So our first international deployment was in Managua, Nicaragua. And we actually worked with deaf teenagers, so very different demographic than we had worked with in the past. We took 12 laptops to the Nicaraguan Deaf Association in partnership with the Inter-American Inter Development Bank. Um, and we actually deployed the laptops at the Deaf Association and created a lending library for deaf teens in the area. And I want to show, I want to share actually one of the videos that we created, but just to give you a sense of the type of atmosphere, you know, the first day we had 13 to 17 year old students, and we asked people to raise their hand if they'd ever used a laptop before, and no one raised their hand. We, we had students that were coming two hours just to take our class. So this is an example of one of the videos that we made for the association so that other students could continue to learn how to use XOs. So that's an example of one of the videos that we made. We created a full library for the association so that we could sustain the project after we left since it was a lending library. Um, and that's still functioning there and still opens this new mode of communication for these teenagers most of which cannot communicate with their parents because Nicaraguan deaf, is, deaf language is um, its actually its own spontaneous language that arose there. And so uh, we now want to give you a sense of what the past week has entailed in terms of the deployment in Hong Kong. Uh, the actual timeline for planning this pilot began about three months ago. Uh, I was initially in touch with Kevin, who's in the corner there. You can wave, Kevin. <laughs> Um, and Kevin then introduced me to TK, who's been phenomenal. They both have been and, and uh, laying the groundwork for this program. And so when we were initially uh, developing this idea, of course, the location was an, imp an important consideration. And so we decided upon Hong Kong uh, as a really great starting point. And so we um, were, were in two different classrooms in two different schools. Each one of these classrooms was a kindergarten uh, classroom with 15 students each. Uh, and uh, as has already been said, we were in Tin Shui Wei and Chun Mun for these two um, for these two deployments. And so on Monday and Tuesday of this week, uh, we hosted a combination of lessons at each one of the schools. And so the way that um, each day worked is that in the morning, we spent uh, two hours at the first school and then in the intermittent period, uh, for the lunch hour, we worked with uh, 
teachers both from the first school and from the second school to help them um, acclimate to the XO as well as to develop um, an understanding of the capabilities of the machine and to understand the software uh, so that they could um, better uh, understand the nuances of what could be done with the XO and develop lessons themselves. And then in the, uh, in the afternoon we would then transition to the other school and um, go through a lesson, a series of lessons during that two hour window as well. So the final thing, and we're going to be going into more depth on the next slide about this, um, but just to give you a general sense, like I said, when we were initially in touch with TK, we were trying to decide what the best starting point was, and this is a really great starting point. And I think that one of the great things about this session is understanding the sustainability mechanism and how this will continue um, uh, beyond just this week. And so uh, we're interested in exploring volunteer opportunities for you all to visit these schools and to maintain the momentum that we've started this week um, with these classrooms and to hopefully scale the model both within the schools and to other schools in the areas. Um, and finally, uh, the, the growth structure, like I said, it's both uh, within Hong Kong and then there are other opportunities I know that we're all interested in exploring in terms of, um, in terms of China. So in terms of the schedule that we're looking at for both schools, the hope is that the pilot will have two key pieces. One is classroom integration and the other piece is research. So over the course of the fall semester, what we're hoping is that, so just to clarify, the students that we actually worked with the past couple of days are attending a special program. So they may not be the kindergarten students that come back in the fall. Um, so what we would wanna have is a new classroom introduction with a basics lesson so that the new students could fully learn how to use the XOs. And then from there, what we would do is continue to integrate the XO into the curriculum by developing additional lesson plans. And that's something that DigiLit would support remotely. And then about three quarters of the way into the fall semester, the hope is that there would be full integration. And that means students are taking XOs home, using them for homework. The XO is across multiple academic subjects. Um, you know, teachers are fully comfortable with it. And then in January, after the fall semester, the hope is that DigiLit would be able to come back 